It's February 2016, and this is Burst 11. Josh Gridley on the Dash Photometry. Now, many of you have listened to the interview I held back in January with Bradley Schaefer, who made the very interesting claim that a star of particular interest, known as Tabby Star, or to some KIC 8462852, a star that had shown short-term anomalous dips in its brightness, was also showing long-term gradual dimming of a very considerable amount, completely unprecedented for a main-sequence star like Tabby Star. Schaefer's work made use of photometry, that is a measurement of a brightness of a star, from a research group called DASH, the Digital Access to a Sky Century at Harvard, which is a, a very extensive data collection and digitization project executed by the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. A little while later, another paper came out by Hipka and Angerhausen that disputed Schaefer's claim that there was an anomalous dimming of the star based upon what they found to be a dimming in several comparison stars near Tabby's star in the DASH photometry. Now, this essentially is a claim that the DASH photometry is poorly calibrated. And Dr. Josh Grinley, the principal investigator of DASH, it takes issue with that. So I, I decided to call Dr. Grinley up and get him to tell his side of the story, why he thinks that Hipka and Angerhausen are wrong, and his own critique of Brad Schaefer's recent claims that Tabby Star is dimming. Please check the show notes for links to everything I've just mentioned, including Dash, the Hipka paper, Schaefer's paper, my interview with Brad Schaefer, and also uh, the, the Landall standard stars that Dr. Grinley refers to in the interview. As you know, I'm calling about the uh, the recent kerfuffle over the dash photometry. Yes, uh, having, yeah, having to do yeah, with which, Dr. Schaefer's uh, paper. I find very irritating. Uh, <laughs> the the Hipkey paper is simply wrong, and what I'm doing, sort of cut a long story short, is writing a paper to show what they've done wrong in selecting data. I mean, the the major problem with the two stars that they uh, mentioned in their paper with having the largest sort of deviation effects similar to what Brad has claimed for the uh, Tabby star uh, are that those are very bright stars and the data, uh, like any uh, telescope or detector system, um, runs into problems when you have saturation. So those stars... Uh, uh, are easily ex explained for their deviant behavior in the modern era data by basically saturation effects. If you if you uh, reject saturated data points, which are always suspect photometry, then the light curves look flat. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Now, now Hipke, um, Hipke looked at twenty eight stars, I believe. Yes, he did, and. Uh, Two of them, well, let's see. One of them is, yeah, <clears throat> seven one, KIC 7180968, which they mentioned in their paper and show in one of their figures. They show in their figure one, the star that Brad is claiming this monotonic decrease on the left, <clears throat> and on the right is this star I just mentioned, KIC 718. 000968. So that one, the upturn in brightness at the end, which they show on the right side of their figure there, is, as I was just saying, largely due to saturated data points. If you reject the saturated data points in the dash photometry, that flattens out. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what 
you know, the trouble with one of the many problems with their papers, they don't explain how they've uh, used the data. Uh, we, we give on the DASH website lots of options for how you can calibrate the data. I assume that they probably have used the KIC calibration. And if you do that, you still have to reject the saturated stars. If you use the APAS calibration, which I think is actually better photometry than the, than the KIC, um, but it gives comparable results, uh, you, you again find that that uh, brightening that they're showing there is simply not present if you reject saturated stars. There are all sorts of other things that you have the option in using the DASH data to select data on. You, all sorts of obvious things like plate defects, which we identify. They're not always real defects, so we give you the option to either reject that uh, a data point that is possibly, and in many cases, is a plate defect. Other major things to look out for in using these data or any data are astrometric errors. So what I'm doing in this uh, paper that I'm putting together is showing the user ultimately what flags you should uh, be aware of in using the data. And it normally doesn't make that big a difference. Most stars are well behaved and you, you have some a few obvious outliers which are typically high astrometric error data points. But in this case, uh, just comparison star that they're pointing out has a similar long-term trend uh, is, uh, once again, just largely due to saturated data points. Right. Now, now DASH now that, has done, uh, I think, over a million, uh, mil millions of light curves for various stars. Is that correct? Many, many, yes, many, many millions. Yeah, we have done roughly a third of the sky already. It's not all been released. There'll be a new data release coming in the next uh, two weeks. But in any case, yeah, we have a huge amount of data. The best way to show that the uh, photometry is reliable is to use, <coughs> excuse me, well understood standard stars, the so called Landolt standards. Are you familiar with those? Landolt, L A N D O L T, Arlo okay. Lando. But he's a. He's a long-established um, photometrist who has set uh, back in the beginning, back in the 1970s, set uh, the sort of the absolute photometric standards that everybody uses uh, at one time or another. And so, what we've done is taken, you know, a, a range of Landolt standards, <laughs> standards as they're called, and run dash light curves on those and done it for stars that are exceptionally red versus those that are exceptionally blue, and we get beautiful, flat, 100-year light curves. So we we use that as uh, a sort of direct proof that when you have stars that you know are constant, because these have been worked on for literally decades to uh, eliminate stars that are variables of any sort, that you get constant light curves. So that's the simplest way to argue that whatever <clears throat> Hipke and his co-author have done is, I'm afraid, just simply not properly uh, making use of the data. Okay, now the, of these Landolt stars, are there many that are similar color and brightness yep, to? Yep, now at, you, in your email you'd asked whether I had done that or we had done that to look at F stars in particular. And no, I haven't. That's, that's uh, something that we can easily do. I've just looked at a, a, a sort of random sampling of these Landolt standards, and they, they're very well behaved. I don't, uh, there's no reason to believe that an F star with its uh, colors would be any different uh, than, than the stars we've looked at, but certainly we, we can and will do that. Uh, there are plenty of these these standards to, to choose from and picking up stars or uh, any other spectral type <clears throat> is, you know, the obvious demonstration that this is basically independent of color. Now, another one of your questions was, has the, uh, did the patrol telescopes that, that we used for these Harvard plates over the hundred years change in the modern era? And yes, they did. 
as you, I think you probably heard from Brad, there, uh, <clears throat> there were changed to a different set of cameras called the Damon cameras. So these were the the cameras used for the uh, northern sky only after 1970. And the emulsions were different. That's, an, I think, another question you were asking um, in the in the modern era. Let's call it 1970 to 1992 when we stopped taking plates. So those emulsions were um, were different, mainly, and I don't understand really in what ways. But for one thing, the most obvious difference is that there were roughly 30 years. Uh, well, 20 years at least, um, more modern than their predecessors. The reason that's relevant is that the stars that would be moderately for exposure times typically being used close to being saturated would be more likely saturated uh, on Mm -hmm. those Damon plates. And I think that's what's going on with this comparison star that I mentioned here at the beginning, this KIC 718. 0968 or whatever it is. So there are those systematic differences, and the Damon plates included also more frequently than what had been done in the early historic days, both red and yellow filters. And uh, but we correct for that in the dash processing. We do color. The color terms are important to do photometry, of course, if you want to. Show light curves consistently in one band, which in the case of DASH is in the Johnson B band, the blue band. And that's where the reason for that was, of course, that most of the Harvard plates, the hundreds of thousands of them, uh, the vast majority are all photographic B, which is essentially the modern day Johnson B magnitude band. But in any case, knowing the colors uh, that we now have a good measure of for stars over the whole sky, thanks to APAS. So we do transform those into Johnson B, and we get the uh, Kepler star of interest here, Tabby star, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we we do get consistent transformations into B, uh, or this this comparison star that we've been talking about. But in any case, yes, there are. Um, or were some systematic differences, but those those are uh, properly taken care of uh, as evidenced in you know the the most direct way by looking at at uh, these Landolt standards. So, how many Landolt standard there, stars are there? Are there... Oh, <clears throat> many hundreds. We could do them all. It would be providing that we've scanned them. We haven't. Uh, we certainly haven't scanned the whole sky, so we would have to. We at this point can only uh, do a systematic study of <clears throat> the Landolt stars that have been scanned. But uh, that's what I was mentioning that we have done uh, mm-hmm. a good number of those already. Not huge numbers, maybe a dozen or so, just as a. This was done actually eight months ago, just uh, for the fun of it, and I was going to write this up then, but didn't. And now this whole uh, hip key paper has given me lots of incentive to set the record <laughs> straight here. I see. Now, your team did find uh, a roughly 100-year variation in a red giant star. Is that correct? Well, we have found, yeah, no, no, there are long-term variations, uh, and yeah, we had several papers on these uh, K-giant stars. This is a former student of mine, Suman Tang, <clears throat> T-A-N-G, who wrote that paper, and there are more papers to come on those stars. Those are very different effects than what we're talking about here. Those were, you know, very large uh, variations, half a magnitude or so, in some cases even a magnitude. So the debate here in this HIPTI paper <clears throat> is about things that are at the couple tenths of a magnitude level and not uh, showing the sort of deviations. Uh, if you look at the Tang paper there, mm-hmm. those variations look very different from what Brad is claiming for the, for the Kepler star. All right. Now the, uh, would you concur with him that, that main sequence stars have not shown this kind of variability? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Main sequence stars. <clears throat> um, well, Main sequence stars do vary, but for very different reasons. They can vary if they are 
M dwarfs. Those are uh, quite variable, uh, but but not smooth long-term hundred-year trends that Brad is claiming for this F star, but rather uh, flare-like behavior. Mm-hmm. But getting getting back to Brad's star or or uh, the star that Brad is claiming, I he, he has a as I told him when he first you know showed me his paper as he was drafting it. And I said, I don't really think this is a compelling case for a long-term variation because if you do the simplest thing, if you take only the dash data that has no flags set, uh, flags, again, just refer to uh, the possibility that that data point should be questioned. You simply say, what does this light curve for tabby star or whatever we want to call this thing look like if I only accept uh, unflagged points? And that's the first thing I did when Brad came to me about this star. And the answer is it's a flat light curve. <laughs> it, it does not uh, doesn't look like you don't have to fit it with anything. You can just see that it's uh, that it's constant. There are no saturated points for Brad star because it's much fainter. So the so it doesn't suffer from the effects that the um, KIC <laughs> 718 star that we keep talking about does. Again, if you if you take only unflagged points, or if you reject the obvious things like high astrometric error, plate defects, things like this, which some of which Brad has done, but I don't think he's done it totally systematically. Um, the evidence statistically that the star is monotonically getting dimmer over the 100 years gets a very, very uh, thin, let's put it that way. You can't rule it out. And my my original objection to the way Brad wrote his paper is he didn't give you know proper error bars, to my way of thinking, on uh, what the uh, probability was that the star really is constant or that it requires a 100-year dimming. I think that's the statistical weak point. But the simplest uh, objection I have, which uh, I've mentioned here now just again, is that if you take just the cleanest data of all, it clearly doesn't show dimming. And it looks like any normal F star, in other words. But I can see why he thought that it looked like it's dimming, because if you don't do that, and if you reject the most obvious things, there is uh, a clear trend uh, over the 100 years of roughly a you know, 10.15 uh, magnitudes. He did, he sees a, a dip uh, around 18, around 1900, yeah. 1905. Do you think that's real? No, no. Again, I think I think this is coming in part from him binning the data, which mm-hmm. is a good thing to do in many cases. But um, I, I don't think that it depends. The trouble with binning the data is uh, unless you've done it, uh, and I don't think Brad has done this. I'm not sure I ever asked him this directly. But unless you do all possible binnings, it's very easy to, you know, bin bin a bunch of points into one well-defined average point, And that looks, you know, like there's been a dip uh, compared to its adjacent points. But if you, if you did your binning on a slightly different uh, center, if you moved, if you moved three points to the right and did the same kind of binning or to the left, um, it, it won't necessarily look like that. And his bins were so coarse. There were five years that I think, Again, I just I don't think he's made a statistically uh, significant claim that, that that dip is real either. It's an interesting argument he's put forward. I think what he's got to do is convince me and the referee. I'm not the referee in his paper. If I were reviewing the paper, which I do a lot of, I would be making basically just all the same points I've made to you about making a more statistically rigorous analysis of the data and answering the, the 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 most obvious fact of why if you take the the data points with absolutely no indications of possible problems or these so-called unflagged points the, the light curve is obviously flat okay well that's very helpful thanks a lot and uh, i'll send you a link when we have this out okay well 
Yep. Thank you. And uh, fun talking with you. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. So, Schaefer believes that the Hipkey results are simply wrong, but he's also quite skeptical about Schaefer's result as well. So, more work is going to be needed. By the way, this is an edited version of that interview with Dr. Grinley. If you want to hear the entire raw interview, warts and all, uh, just send just send me a, an email at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com, and I'll send you a link to the raw interview. The show notes will have all the links that you're interested in and explanations of some of the things he talked about, like APAS and Kepler catalogs and so on. Um, it's all quite interesting if you're into astronomy, if you're just interested in knowing, is Tabby's star really dimming or not? Well, I'm afraid we don't have the answer for you here today. Uh, it's clearly not convinced everyone, so stay tuned, and we'll be back with more information as it develops. And also, I am really trying to get some of the original team from the Planet Hunters to come and and talk to us on the WOW signal, either on a full episode or a burst. So stay tuned for that. We'll see what happens. So this has been Burst 11 of the WOW Signal podcast. It's February 2016. Music by Jason Robinson and Erica Lloyd. This is your host, Paul Carr.